Do you play video games? No! Video games are for idiots. Mike check. Mike check. SD. One, two, one, two. Mike check. Mike check. Mike check. Two, one, two. Mike check. Mike check. Mike check. Welcome to the Saga Pod. My name's Kinder. My name's Frank. Brought to you in part by... Daniel Bryan's impending retirement. Yes, in case you have not heard, Daniel Bryan is retiring due to some fucking medical bullshit. Concussions. Yeah. For those of you who don't care, moving on. Concursions. <laughs> uh, tonight on the Saga Pod, we're going to be talking about Dark Souls 3. Uh, a little bit of Kerbal Space Program and some other old games. <laughs> Uh, and my recent experience is restarting a campaign in Shadow of Mordor. And maybe touching on some tabletop gaming if we have time. Yeah! Yeah. All right, let's start off with the Dark Souls tray. Dank Souls, tray deuce. everyone. April, what is it, 12th? April 12th, 2016. Get hype. Get ready to praise. Praise that sun. We uh, are planning some content to come out along with the uh, Dark Souls release or along that along that week, sometime in that time frame. Yeah, nothing as big and crazy as yeah, we're not doing a forty eight hour Metal stream. Gear Saga, <laughs> but you know it'll be it'll be pretty interesting. You'll enjoy it. Yeah, I think so. Um, be a good time to coincide with our possible relaunch on the video side of things if uh, we can get everything situated properly with our schedules and such. But right. you know. uh, by the way, uh, I know we've been out for a good while, almost a month. We did have the interview with uh, David D'Angelo of Yakub Games. We have done that, but we lost our end of the audio. We had a crash. We had a colossal failure. and We, we fucked up. We fucked up bad. We saved his audio, so we're going to try to do something with that at a later, t- later time. Um, and I have gotten a backup, a uh, little digital recorder backup. Uh, to save our skin next time so we don't have that happen. But, yeah, we, we fucked that up. That's why we've been out for so long and haven't had any content. Sorry, guys. Yeah, that was our planned episode, or at least, yeah, for that two weeks. But, yeah. Yeah. This thing's fucked up. It's fucked up. I got to get up on my mic. Sound get up counter. on that mic. Get up on that mic. Get up on that mic. Oh, yeah. But, yes, uh, Dark Souls 3. Um so, The impending release. What is it? Landor? Uh, what, what's the name uh, of the, the well, area? Well, it's a... N- Anne Orlando was the big place. Uh, the Anor- the norm was Lordran was from Lordran. Dark Souls one, yes. and this appears to be if I were you know I'm not one of these big you know Dark Souls lore people, um, like that's more like the only Afro or not even only Afro yeah. but uh, more like epic name bro and shit like that doing the. <laughs> uh, I haven't really gotten Vati. into any of the story, but I am yeah. very interested to interested to know what the hell an unkindled is. Yeah, I can imagine it's falling along the same lines of, like, fire and burning things and fire is life, so, like, all that kind of stuff. I feel like if you were to place this one, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, Dark Souls 2 takes place before Dark Souls 1. Maybe. In, like, sort of the whatever timeline it is, or maybe it's post, I can't really remember. Uh, I don't think they really have a set timeline. I mean, the timeline. areas <laughs> are, like, yeah, I mean, but the areas have some similarities, and they have similar design features and such and like uh you know there's a blight town equivalent in dark souls 2 yeah. you know there's a forest of the giants and all that stuff you know there's an, an equivalent of everything in each of the games but nothing like you know straight like yeah. you know the first area in dark souls 2 is basically undead bird but yeah. right, it's actually a lot closer to the first level in demon souls really yeah it's um, also the only Souls game without a boss before you meet the uh, Firekeeper, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, the most that they really give you is that, you know, weird instant die fucking ogre at the top. But there's no, like, real yeah. ass boss. I mean, you can get through that entire first bit of that game without dying and getting to the, you know, uh, the Firekeeper shrine or whatever. Um, yeah. The 
Majula. Yeah, Majula. you can get to that whole area. That. Um, with Dark Souls Three, like if I, if from what I can see, just from from watching the trailer and everything, it seems like it's going for a very even like more dark and collapsed yeah. society than the first Dark Souls. It or? seems like one of the things that uh, I'm thinking the they're going with the unkindled is yeah. like the unkindled seems like an even lower form than like the undead. Yeah. So you're like at least Instead embers, of just being you know, like hollow. You yeah. Know, you with, with their whole theme of like embers and fire and all that. Yeah. I mean, with, with the, the embers and all, I mean, you can still make that a fire. They can still become fire, but when you're, you haven't unkindled, even been kindled ashes. Yet. Yeah. Well, yeah. I feel like it's like a unkindled isn't so much undead as it is like never alive. If that makes sense, you know, yeah. like it's not like you never is. You're not a dead person who doesn't have life anymore. That would be, you know, a hollow. That would be something like that. But then an unkindled would be like, this is a thing which never had life to begin with, yeah. which kind of would go along the same lines as like they're, giants that they've had in the game that are more organic and like yeah. plant like than just like big burly beast outside of in in Dark Souls two at least. In Dark yeah. Souls one, you know, everybody was a fucking giant, you know. <laughs> um one of the things that I read, um I don't know how much truth there is to it, but uh it was saying that uh, to in order to create a bonfire, um uh, you had to like have a human sacrificial thing. And, you know, maybe that that was what the Unkindled was, was, like, you have to pretty much stab this. Like, there was some lore that they threw out. Yeah. And, you know, you have to, like, stab through this person. With that them. particular sword that yeah, creates the bonfire. Something like that. And, yeah. like, you know, then you kindle them into a bonfire. And maybe that's the sacrificial person that never even became a fucking bonfire. So they're just that low. You're yeah. fucking nobody. Like, or, like, the society collapsed or civilization collapsed before they could become... A bonfire, yeah. like their entire purpose was to become a bonfire, but now that there's no one making bonfires. They just sort of roam the land, yeah. and it seems like post Dark Souls one, the same area, um, because you know they talked about you know there will just be darkness. You know, there's already not much, right? Basically, yeah. So you know if there's nothing but dark now, there's no not even any embers, then you're in a world of literal dark. Here's, yeah. This is the dark. Welcome to Dark Souls. Yeah, this is like the the. Continuing, I mean, like, even, like, Dark Souls 2, like, I felt like there was more civilization. There was more life yeah. to Dark Souls 2, while it was still, you know, the same bleak and nightmarish medieval design philosophy. Like, there was a, there were people, yeah. a lot more NPCs, there was a lot more of a concept of the purpose of the land, especially, was purely like, hey, you go here when you die because you're seeking some kind of rebirth or some kind of life or right. whatever. And uh, with Dark Souls 2, it was like, no, the fucking world's fucked. With Dark Souls 1, it's like, the world's fucked. Everything's dead. And, you know, you <coughs> might have an opportunity to bring back the um, fire or whatever, you know? Like, you could choose to stay and kindle the flame and try to extend out whatever the age of fire was. Yeah. And this is like after that, the other ending, which is you bring about the age of dark. Yeah. And so I think this is like you bring about the age of dark and the entire world plunges into true darkness, you know, yeah. which doesn't give me hope for any kind of uh, <laughs> lighting effects outside of, <laughs> I don't know. It does. Flames the, uh, and shit. At least the opening intro looks really fucking gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, well, Dark Souls 2's opening intro was fucking amazing. Yeah. Like it was a, fucking incredible i mean uh, dark souls ones was good but it was just like video game good dark yeah. souls twos was like fucking hell they, they had like a lot more shit. experience too because uh, reading up on the the dark souls one pc engine yeah uh, they had no experience they didn't know what the fuck they were oh, doing oh yeah it's, it's japan they don't know any shit and, about um, PC games. like uh shout out to jeff by the way for finally starting dark souls jeff jeff but uh he he started dark souls i finally got him to do it and uh, he started off, and I told him, I told him from the beginning, like, you're going to hate this game to begin with. You're really going to fucking hate it. You're going to hate the system. You're going to hate the, the animation priority. You're going to fucking hate it. But beat the first boss, and you're fucking hooked. Yeah. You'll love it. Yeah. And, of course, exactly that happened. He went through the whole thing, and it takes him, like, if We're talking, like, the Taurus demon, not the yeah. little asylum demon. No, no, even just the asylum demon. Yeah. It For me, it was like just beating the hours. asylum demon was pretty easy because, like, 
I was expecting the Demon Souls. Because Demon Souls has the exact same situation where yeah. you're going through a little tutorial area, learning how to play the game, and then it ends with a boss fight, which is basically the Asylum Demons, like same design and everything, yeah. a little less textury, like very early PlayStation Three yeah. until. Um, but it's fucking impossible. <laughs> like you could, I mean, it's sort of like it would be like fighting the Asylum Demon with the broken around. sword. Yeah, that's that's what he did. Like the first three times he tried to do it, and he was like, "This is fucking impossible." <laughs> I said, "Go left." Yeah, <laughs> but uh, he finally did it after. Uh, God There's a thing that literally says "run" on the floor. If yeah. you don't read that, you don't. He did. He didn't know what the fuck to do. Cause yeah. he's. He's so young that he's never played a difficult well, game. Well, this is a game that's b- entirely based around punishing bad players. Yeah. It's like it's built around like it is not a really it's not really that hard of a game when you really break it down. It is yeah. the most fair game. Oh, it's very fair. In my it's opinion. like Mega Man fair though. Yeah, like it's like the if you fuck up it's entirely your fault. Now people will complain, "Oh, it's fucking unfair. You got to cheese the bosses." No, you can choose to cheese the bosses and that's the game fucking up. Yeah. And not giving you a real challenge by allowing you to cheese it. You know, it's not, yeah. it, you don't have to beat those bosses by cheesing them. You know, yeah. you can fucking actually. And there's places where them. it's built in that you're supposed to cheese your way out of it. Like, right. That's how you play Dark yeah. Souls. Like the entire point of you going under the bridge in Dark Souls 1 to shoot the tail of the dragon is because that's the only way you're going to get that, that sword. Yeah. You know, that's the only way you're going to get it, and it's only there so you can do that one thing. Yeah. And. You know, it's a it's a stupid little video game thing, but that's you know, it's that's the it's the Welcome to Dark Souls. Yeah. <laughs> it's a full expression of like the classic NES game design of yeah. like, hey, there are gonna be secrets and shit hidden around here and you're gonna find them. And like, you know, shit, everybody who grew up playing Mario knew about the warp zones and yeah. knew about like in Mario three about you know, ducking behind the block and falling down and be able to get the warp whistle and all that yeah. stuff. Like, you just grew up with this stuff. It was mimetically passed along to you <laughs> through, like, school and stuff like that. And the uncles that worked uncles in Nintendo. Uncles that worked in Nintendo, yeah. <laughs> and Which is why I'm hoping that uh, Levin, um, Ashley's husband, gets a job at Nintendo because then... Is he, he like... Yeah, he got a job that? interview. I don't wow. know what happened with it. Like, tech support. What does he do? He's He was in the Air Force. He's trying to get a job in uh Washington to Well, good on you, Levin. Yeah. He's trying to get a job at Nintendo and like it's like I want him to do it so Caden can actually say I have an, an uncle, uncle who works, works at Nintendo. Nintendo. That's awesome. <laughs> Jesus Christ. But uh but yeah that's exactly like you just learn these things as you go about by just being around the game, talking about the game. That's the same thing with Dark Souls. Yeah. Dark Souls is the full expression of that in a three D environment. No other game has really had that level of and, and for it to be like their for a purpose and for you to do it a particular way if you want to. Yeah. Not like with Halo where there's like hidden stuff where there's skulls and, you know, yeah. the weird monkey people and shit like that. It's like <laughs> those are just little thing. Easter eggs and shit like that. Yeah, this is fucking in the game. This, this is, is like you just you can, to have Yeah, exactly. It's game, a yeah. little minor thing. It's you get this or you get that. You yeah. know, it just it changes the game. And you don't have to feel bad about doing it. Like I never felt bad about using the warp zones in Mario. Yeah. But I can tell you this I don't know what, like, World 4 through 5, actually, like, World 4 through 7 look like because I never played them because I went right to the fucking end. I think that was one thing that I liked a lot about 2 was I went into 1 knowing about that, uh, what, Drake Sword? Yeah. Uh, I went in there knowing about the Drake Sword, and I got it, and I kind of felt bad about cheesing the whole thing. Right, yeah. But I also couldn't use a regular weapon. Well, when you get game. when you get it, you think, "Well, this is fucking amazing, the best sword ever." Yeah. But then you realize, then you get to a point you're where you're not can't going use it to be anymore. able to use it forever. Yeah, that's what's great about it. Because if it was like a really a cheesy fucking thing, you would get it and you would never use any other sword. Yeah, but you can only go so far with it, and that, so it forces you to go down a different path. And you didn't have so much of that though in two, like their ba- their weapon balance and everything. I'm not saying the game was better because one's one's bosses and story and everything. One's got more memorable bosses. I think it's got a better world layout and a better flow to it. I think two has like better better combat, better balance, better enemy types, better variety of enemy types. Better multiplayer, for sure. Definitely better multiplayer. A lot more access to covenants and things that are interest to you. you And that balance, it was pretty awesome because you can use whatever weapon that you want. You can really do any class you want, and you don't feel gypped. 
by the end of the game. Right. Yeah. Because my in game weapon in my current save on Dark Souls Two is a long sword, and I'm doing really well. Um, yeah, I mean that's that's what's great about it, you know. Like I, I you, they have all those like epic weapons, uh, named weapons and yeah. shit like that. And Which you can, I do have a backup that I use for PvP because yeah. uh, there is one. Uh, the warp sword is yeah. fucking like almost broken for PvP, <laughs> but uh, the long sword is, is one I'm using. I just have it with lightning and uh, I'm a faith strength build. Yeah, and it's fucking amazing. It's really good. Yeah, and like that's what's really great about it. Like it really helps. It helps guide you down the right path when it comes to that kind of stuff because it doesn't want you to, well, like it it doesn't throw you easy shit. Yeah, like it's obvious it's a hard game, but again, like I said, it's hard, tough but fair, tough but fair. It's yeah. the military dad of video games. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it treats you with a little bit more respect than a lot of other games do. Yeah. So some people ex- like I think their expectations for modern video games are so fucking low. Because they expect to be treated like babies and, and shit like exactly that. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Because he, you know, prime example was with Jeff when he first did it. And then he beat the boss and he sent me this message that was just like four or five lines long. Let me, let me find that. Continue riffing. I'm going to find that message. Well, I think like, you know, they, they create an expectation of difficulty through their marketing and everything like that. And by creating that expectation, they expect you to co- go into it with this sort of fear or this dread of it. And that was like my biggest problem with playing Demon Souls. It was like all I heard was this game is so hard. This game is so hard. Yeah. You know? And then when I played it, I'm like, yeah, you're right. This game is fucking hard. Fuck this game, you know? And I stopped <laughs> playing it because like I was not ready for it, you know, yeah. or didn't expect it to to be what it was, you know. Yeah. Um I found that message. Right. Uh so Jeff started playing one and you know he's going through the first bits. I'm giving him some some hints, but there's very only so light. Much, there's only so much you can tell somebody. Yeah, in after the a certain area. point, you're either just talking mumbo jumbo, <laughs> or you're just like literally like this Do close to saying, "Give me the controller." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he had sent me a message just before he beat this boss. Uh, he's like, "I I understand what get good means now. I can legit feel myself getting good." And then three seconds later. All caps. I did it. <laughs> Just a jumble of letters. <laughs> Fuck you, boss. You a piece of shit. I'm the boss. I'm the fucking boss. Fuck you. Fuck him. Oh, the man. That shit felt good. <laughs> and then he sent me a screenshot and he said, "Fucking right. Good job." <laughs> and I, I said, "LOL, my little Jeff, my little Hefe growing up." And then immediately after he responds, "I'm gonna make you proud, Papa." <laughs> <laughs> so shout out to Jeff. Good job, son. I am proud of you. There's a, there's a, yeah, it's that expectation, you know, like people have, um, and that, that is a great way of putting it. I know what get good means now, you know, because you go into it like, there is the way people talk about dark souls, you know? And I've, I was one of those people when I first, I was like, Oh, you just don't get it. But that really is what it is. You just don't get it. You've never played a game like this. So me talking to you on any level, you will not understand it. Like someone like Brad, he doesn't get Dark Souls because he'll never play Dark Souls. He doesn't like anything good anyway. Well, he doesn't like anything good anyway. His (laughs) favorite movie is My Super Ex-Girlfriend. So, like, you know, he doesn't like good things. He doesn't like getting good He doesn't like getting good Unless it's Street Fighter and then he gets okay and will never learn a super. Right. And, and like, (laughs) if if I ever owned a Street Fighter game and played it as much as Brad did, I'd probably be better than Brad. Yeah. But having never owned a Street Fighter game outside of, you know, old, like the modern ones, having never played Street Fighter 4 outside of the occasional pickup game, you know, I don't expect to be good at Street Fighter. Yeah. You know, same way with Dark Souls. If you've never touched it, you can't say, oh, pff, 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 Dark Souls. Like you're Souls, never going you know? to be good. Until you're, and you're, you're never good. going to be good because you don't, you don't know what you're going into, you know? Yeah. Like, he's looking at it from the perspective of being a third-person hack-and-slash-style game, and he's expecting Dynasty Warriors or something. Yeah. Or when he's really, expecting, like, Baldur's Gate. Yeah, or that's Baldur's I Gate. Expecting. I think that's what he was looking at, was, like, that Baldur's Gate game, that Dark Horizon, or Baldur's Gate Demons Rising or whatever it was, or Demon Sign or something like that. Yeah. Like, he was expecting something like that. And really, it's like, no, it's something completely different. Like, I love the combat system in Dark Souls because it demands so much of you, yeah. you know? It's not, and you accept, oh, it's just light attack, strong attack. Where it's like, motherfucker, you can press a button and now you're dual, you know, you're using your sword with two hands. Yeah. And then 
you I can, can also really be using two, using two different fucking weapons. Right I still haven't gotten into power stancing yet. I I don't think I'm good enough for it yet. Yeah, it's a, well, maybe because I haven't tried it. Uh, but like I have really res- come to respect the dual uh, double handing. Yeah, it's really really handy with a long sword, especially when you're um, a face strength build. Yeah, because it does give you that extra bit of strength. Yeah, and that's what you really want out of uh, out of a combat system is to actually give you more opportunities and more techniques. Like yeah. it's not going to go full Devil May Cry, you know. Yeah, and and actually now speaking of Devil May Cry, speaking of Capcom and uh, Devil May Cry, um. You should get uh, Dragon's Dogma. Dragon's Dogma? Yeah, it just came out uh, on PC, finally, after being out on consoles for a few years. Mm. Um, It's Dragon's Dogma Dark Arisen. It is just the weirdest fucking game ever. Like, I love it. Like, it's like (laughs) like up there. It's like just one of these weird, like, out of fucking nowhere games. Yeah. But the moment I first saw it, I was like, this could be really fucking good. Or fucking really awful, awful you know, because what I was like when you're looking at the trailers and stuff for it, it looks like, you know, it's going to be this amazing, epic, sprawling, Dark Souls-esque kind of thing, you know, yeah. and but it, like with a little bit more of an open world and but, you know, you're going into a thing. Well, this could be like the Japanese answer to Skyrim or something. <coughs> but then I started thinking about it, I was like, I've played games you know, like games like Way of the Samurai and Yakuza and things like that, that that give you the expectation of a Western style game, mm-hmm. but they're filled and to the brim with so much Japanese archaic game design philosophy yeah. that you can't break through it <laughs> enough to enjoy the actual game that's there. Yeah, uh, this one kind of almost sta- it's like staggers that line. You know, it's like, it's really fucking great. It's got an insane combat system that's sort of like a Devil May Cry light kind of combat system. Yeah. And it's also really dependent on which weapon and which path you go and which class you kind of choose. Yeah. But like, you know, there's a dual wielding kind of really fast combo based uh, system that goes like, that's one style. And there's like the heavy weapon guy and then there's the sort of normal sword fighting guy and there's the wizard and all that stuff. And you can go down those different paths. And but then also it gives you like a heavy attack and a light attack, but it also gives you two sort of special attacks to go yeah. along with it. And these are usually like range typed or different kinds of things. Like I would use the thing with also with a bow, and so I'd have like a bow attack. And you can choose and slot out those different things. And even like for instance, the combo guy, one of those specials that you can choose is a fucking cancel. Oh right, yeah. Yeah. So that's, like that's some really important in fighting games. Yeah, exactly. And that, a lot from exactly. Like and it borrowed a lot from Devil May Cry, I think, because Devil May Cry is really heavy on the cancels and stuff like yeah. that. Like really heavy on because you need the cancel to be able to get out of the combo so that you can go in for a different style, yeah. you know. And it's got a lot of juggling moves and stuff like that. If you ever watch it's like Street insane. Fighter, like high level Street Fighter play, yeah. the cancel is what makes what separates the good fighters from the great fighters. Yeah. Because, you know, you got ultra cancels and stuff i mean you have cancels that use fucking meter yeah and when you're before you get good at like street fighter you don't understand the point of that why would i end my move before it's done and use meter to do it yeah because you can then go into another set of moves you can and start use a whole that combo. to chain a different combo into a whole and different set of moves. i was watching yeah. one of the, like the especially the if you got a guy who's teams. really good yeah. at placement and getting in positions and everything like that like if he can get out of the area that you're in, you can cancel out of the combo you sort of locked yourself into and then move into like more of an air-based kind of offense, yeah. you know, because he's moved up into sort of more of a vertical style, you know. Yeah. And it's really, that's the whole theme around fighting games, you know, it's position and placement and timing, you know, it's all yeah. this stuff. I still haven't gotten like canceling and those kind of moves down in Skullgirls. I really want to, but. I mean, well, the Skullgirls tutorial is really great about teaching you how to play a fighting game. Yeah. I think that, that Skullgirls tutorial should be lifted and placed in every single fighting game that ever gets released. Well, it was made by, like, fighting game It's made game by people who, yeah, and they teach you all kinds of basic fucking fundamental shit about playing a fighting game, especially on a competitive level, Yeah, that no other fighting game attempts to teach you in their tutorial mode. They yeah. just want to teach you how to fucking do the moves. Yeah. This is, well, here's why you would do this move. Here's yeah. why you need to know why how to do this move. Here's... Why you need to know how to do, you know, forward punch, down punch, down kick, you know, and here's yeah. how you, why you need to know how to block 
directionally and stuff like that. Like yeah. it teaches you all that stuff and explains it to you very clearly. And it's like the polar opposite was uh, Killer Instinct. Yeah. Because I played some Killer Instinct on the Xbox and I mean it's it's a good like button masher and all and I'm pretty good at fighting games. This yeah. is like next level just here's a bunch of shit. Here's how you do it. Don't know why you would do it, but here it is. They give you the, they give you like, um, with Skullgirls, they give, it's sort of like a Lego set. They give you the Lego set and they said, here's how, you, here's how you build it. With every other fighting game, they give you the Lego set and say, have fun. Yeah. And then you have to figure out, how, well, how am I supposed to turn this into a spaceship? Yeah. I don't know, like, how this piece fits with this piece. I just know I have them now. Yeah. You taught me how, what they are and how to use them. Why is there this useless three well, second delay I, mid attack? Yeah. When you- how <laughs> do I use it and why do I use it? You know, those yeah. are important things that they don't teach you in those kind of things. By the way, fuck Beowulf. He is an asshole. <laughs> God, fuck, I hate Beowulf players now. I can't even fucking play Skull Girls online anymore. Are they still updating that pretty regularly? Yeah, they, they okay. have, like, two new characters already. Oh, okay. So I just Beowulf haven't paid attention to it much, you know, just because, like, after the whole weirdness with losing Konami as a publisher, and then they went to a Lab Zero, or, th- or they are uh, Lab Zero. Know. They went to, like, uh, Autumn Games or something like that uh, to publish them for, because they just couldn't fucking get publishing. Um... I'm really interested in, but yeah, I, again, going back to my original point, try out Dragon's Dogma. It's probably pretty cheap. I'm not even going to attempt to get into all the minutia of that game, <laughs> but like, it's like... We'd be pandering to a very small crowd, most likely. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, it's Devil May Cry meets sort of like an open world fantasy game. Yeah. Meets um, like with little bits of other games that just make it just right for me you know like there's enough there's like enough shadow of the colossus in there for me to go yeah all right you, know? <laughs> you are such a fucking shadow whore shadow colossus is fucking amazing not only is it an artistically beautiful game it has like an insane gameplay loop that just keeps you coming back for yeah. more and it's one of the few games that does successes that are actually failures you yeah. know for for the story like it does that well enough to like to be um artistic without pretentious i guess yeah you know or be to be interesting without being too pretentious like it it does that on point i think uh the but there's like a climbing mechanic in dragon's dogma like you can fucking jump Onto these big ass fucking enemies, these giant like hydras yeah. and shit like that. Any enemy, really, you can grab on any motherfucker. Jump onto it and start climbing up it like it's fucking, yeah. <laughs> like it's fucking Shadow of the Colossus. Like there's a hydra boss in like the midpoint of the intro, basically, because the game takes fucking forever to get started because it's yeah. made by Japanese people. So like the midpoint of like the basically the tutorial. When you're getting to this sort of camp, this fucking Hydra attacks, and of and it's a fucking legit, straight up fanti- fantasy Hydra, you know, like yeah. this isn't like the Dark Souls Hydra where it's got a bunch of heads, but you cut one off and you just have to cut off all the heads. Yeah, his legit head grows fucking back two <laughs> at a time, you know. So you gotta be really fucking good, and you have to use fire to actually to to, to, to cauterize, to cauterize the, wound. the wounds and seal the and like it's fucking amazing like it is insane and there's like a fucking griffin boss fight that is the bloodiest fucking most brutal thing in the world and you're taking like five guys so like with god you. of war but good yeah and like you take and you have these things called pawns and there you create your pawn i probably just pissed off some people with that actually <laughs> probably i, I don't, I don't really, really know like god of war. if there's god of war fanboys out there please uh <laughs> they i mean there are yeah there are i don't know why I I played a lot of God of War and I played a lot of the God of War games, but I'm not gonna sit there and say, yeah, God of War is so great. You know, it's not. It's a decent. It's okay. It's like it did what it did really good for the time, but nobody else is doing it now. Everybody else does it and they do it better. Yeah. You know, it was like a platinum games with a little bit less action and a lot more dude murder. Well, they wanted to create a game that looked like a movie in a way, you know, or that played uh, like how action movies play out when you do like, these I guess big they wanted a 300, 300, the game. Well, it was before it came out labels. before 300, 300 oh, okay. still a lot for <laughs> God of War actually like, design wise. Yeah. I think like, uh, or at least the movie did the, I mean, the comic book is a whole different story. Um, but the, uh, so you have these things called pawns, and they're like they're these dudes. They're just you use the same character creation tools you use to create your guy, 
but instead you're creating this assistant and they're like treated as sort of like soulless minions that follow yeah. you around and, and it act as your backup and you have your pawn and then you can bring in other players pawns from around the world and hire them to work alongside you and you can have up to like five of these motherfuckers so it's like you and a party of five like random like soulless NPCs running around and murdering goblins and fucking throwing <laughs> bandits off of fucking cliffs <laughs> nice doing cool shit like you can fucking combo your attacks if you time it right you can get a dude who's good at juggling people who knocks a motherfucker up in the air and you pull out your bow and shoot him with 10 arrows at once out of the fucking sky <laughs> it gets fucking insane it is an insane game but it's so like art got the full of our, uh, archaic japanese game design yeah. stuff that just you know it can turn somebody off Sounds pretty cool. Yeah. I think uh, it, I was only attracted to it be, and this leads into what my Dark Souls conversation because I was attracted to the game because of Dark Souls, yeah. you know, like the the concepts are there cuz it again is also like Dark Souls in that it's a, it's it's a hard game, but it's hard on purpose. Yeah. Like I was fucking just out at night in the open world and the fucking main bad guy dragon of the game just shows up out of fucking nowhere. <laughs> No, <laughs> you just wreck your shit. Yeah, no warning, nothing. Just fucking shows up, wrecks my shit. Like it's just a fucking random encounter. You had nothing. There was nothing you do about it. They tell you don't go out at night. <laughs> so there was something I could have done about yeah. it, which was not be outside. <laughs> but there's no like there is fast travel in Dark Arisen. They added it like with this like there's like stones you throw up in the air and you return back to like the last little point that you were at. Yeah. Um. But. With the, with the, this is I was playing the original Dragon's Dog before the Dark Arisen patch, and so I was just out and about and had no way of getting back to the city, and it was getting dark, and I'm going through these woods like, oh shit, I got really fucking far off the main path, yeah. and all of a sudden here comes this fucking dragon out of nowhere and just wrecks my shit. And I tried to fight him, I didn't work. <laughs> tried. <laughs> I tried. Uh, moving on to our next topic. Yes, um, I did start replaying um, Shadow of Mordor, and speaking on difficult games, like that's. It's one of those games where you also just have have to get good. You know, it's kind of like the Batman. Com it's exactly like the Batman combo system. But uh, something I noticed is that the really minute, almost overlooked um, upgrades that you get, yeah, make a fucking huge difference. Because I got through the PC version that I didn't. I played it like half halfway or three quarters of the way through because I had other shit to do for the podcast. Yeah, <coughs> and I never really got to get through with the game. You know. So I picked up this playthrough and started picking things that, you know, I really liked from the, my past playthrough. Yeah. And right off the bat, you know, I of course I tried to take on like 50 dudes at once because I could before. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I tried to take on 50 dudes at once. You're used to it. Ladies, <laughs> plants, men. Men, gentlemen. <laughs> I heart men. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I, I tried to do that and I get my shit fucking kicked in and I'm like okay well I screwed up because that, in that game you know you screw up and you get hit once and then it just you know snowball effects and you before you know it you're in your little hit stun thing where you gotta move the thing into a circle yeah yeah and I forgot all about that and I didn't realize because you're not thinking about you're just hitting buttons yeah. you're still in the middle of thinking about your combo and all of a sudden it's like eh, and like oh shit and you fucking die yeah yeah I so, died so many fucking times to those fucking orcs with that shit I promoted a lot of orcs, okay? <laughs> yeah. I am a job creator in Shadow of Mordor. There was this one guy um, uh, this time around called uh, something Ear Collector. Yeah. And he he was just, like, s invulnerable to fucking everything. Have we, you we run into any before. of my dudes? Your deaths? Yeah. It's, it's on Xbox One. So. Oh, you're playing the Xbox One Yeah, version. it was okay. on, like, super gotcha. deep discount. All right, yeah. Uh, it's, I'll, I'll tell you this. It doesn't look half as good as it does on PC. Oh, the PC version is amazing. Even on my sh shitty little graphics card, it still looks yeah. fucking great for what it is. Yeah, I had this thing maxed out because it's fucking with my system in it. Yeah. It's n not even comparable. I mean, that th that's one of the things that really <laughs> pisses me off about Arkham Knight in particular, like, this is the same publisher. Yeah. Why did they have this edict for Shadow of Mordor to run really fucking good on PC or be co even better than the console version? Yeah. But then Arkham Knight comes out, and it's just a... It just shits the bed. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can say, oh, they ported it over somebody else. Well, why did the... I'm assuming they ported Shadow of Mordor over somebody else, too, yeah. to fucking do. So why did they do a better job? Why don't you just use them again, you know? I have no clue. Like... But, uh, anyway... 
was that uh, ear collector dude. Like he was just invulnerable to range, invulnerable to stealth, invulnerable to like everything. I couldn't jump over him, and yeah. he had like this poison attack bullshit. Yeah, so he just kept on those fucking guys. my day up. So he poisoned me every time. I couldn't avoid it. Yeah. And I couldn't see the combos coming. So I had to start watching the dudes like get ready to slash. And then yeah. I had to break my combo trying to counter. So I, I went through this like 50 times and he got up to like level 18. Jesus. And I, I barely had like four hours in this game. Well, not even that. I probably had two and a half hours into the game at this point. Yeah. But I kept going after him because I wanted Because that's that. what you want. I wanted his yeah. fucking, I wanted his head on a pike. Did you ever start getting to like in your PC playthrough? Did you ever start getting to the uh, War Chiefs and doing all that stuff? I started doing that now on the on the console. Okay, version. yeah, because that I did was, on PC. As that well. was that shit. When I started getting into that, it was just like. But there's a strategy. It, yeah, there's a strategy. There's a lot of strategy to it. But like you know, you want to go into it kind of blind. Yeah. The first time, just to see like what exactly you're dealing with, and you're fucking dealing with some <laughs> fucking craziness because like. They're taking place in areas that you've been to before, and so you kind of understand the layout. You know, there's a lot of these main sort of orc fortresses. Yeah. And that's where they're usually hanging out at. And you know the layouts, but then it's like you get there, and it's like, okay, you got to kill 20 of his archers before he'll come out. Yeah. Okay. So you got to sneak around. You got to do it stealthily, because if you send off an alarm, they're going to be all over the place, and he's not going to come out. Yeah. So, yeah, you got to do it stealthily. So, yeah, you're sneaking around. You're killing all these archers, and all of a sudden he shows up, and he's got... Four of the other fucking big time orcs with him. Yeah, you know. So that's the strategy that I found out because I didn't last time it never really rung up with me. I guess. Yeah. But this time I started looking, and you know, you can see the connection. You can see the lines. The other guys. Yeah, yeah. So I started like targeting. His yeah, you dudes. start going for the guys, and you start branding them. Yeah. <laughs> so that they work for you, and then when you get there, you fucking pull it, and they all fucking start attacking yeah. everybody. It's, it's fucking beautiful. It's really brilliant. I really love that like, system. Like, I want that system to be in every fucking game now, you it know? Really like, I want system. that system. Like, that. you can tell this game started off as a Batman game. Yeah. You know, there's no denying it. They want to, you can tell, like, the bones of this game came from, like, some kind of other Arkham subset kind of game. Yeah. They, they, I guess, retooled it to be in the World of Rings franchise or in that mo model because, I guess, they saw the writing on the wall for Which, Batman or for something. For the storyline, I, I can't figure out if, if it's before, during, or after fucking the main... It's supposed to take place between The Hobbit and Fellowship of the Ring. Okay, and that makes a little more sense. It's like, it's right in between, and and it's really kind of funny when you look at it from a lore perspective. Yeah. Uh, if any, I, I could give two shits less about Tolkien, but uh, <laughs> for people that are fans of Tolkien, like the whole story of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings is... Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yeah. There's nobody in Lord of the Rings who's ever become all powerful who didn't become a fucking nightmare evil yeah. person. <laughs> and this entire the entire story of Shadow of Mordor is you basically become God and like just can <laughs> become the fucking best fighter guy ever. You're like the Mary Sue of the goddamn Lord of the yeah. Rings universe. You know, fucking you're half wraith, half human, half other kin nightmare creature and like all these fucking things combined together and you're super fast and can murder orcs in their sleep and all yeah. kinds of stuff like that. And I want that to be the sequel of the game is like, now you were just some lowly ranger or something and yeah. you got to fucking fight your dude from the you first gotta, game the and it imports your character from the first <laughs> game. See, that would, that would be beautiful. You know, just to, just to do that, just to fuck your day up. Just uh, this guy that you spent, you know, 150 hours on. Yeah, you got to kill him now. Now he's the king of the orcs, <laughs> you know, or something like. Or you got. It reminds me of that D and D campaign that someone posted one time. It was uh, everybody rolls a character and does whatever the hell they want with it. Yeah, you know, I want to be a level 100, you know, knight with all this extra shit. And uh, you know, they everybody just asks, well, "Can I do this?" Yeah, fucking go for it. And so everybody rolls yes, these amazing and, characters, yeah. and they say, all right, well, uh, we have your foes for this campaign now. <laughs> we have the enemies. <laughs> Roll That's your characters. That's a great way to do it, yeah. yeah. Just have everybody, you know, Just use their hubris nightmare. against them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the thing. If I was in that situation, I would always – I don't ever, like, power game when it comes to that kind of stuff. I want, like, the, you know, dumpy fucking, like, cook who can't fight or something. Yeah. You know, that would be the character I'd be interested in playing. Um, but, yeah, that's – Fucking Shadow of Mortar is an incredible game, and like it could not have come out in a better year because that was a fucking drought year yeah, really for video was. games, and so like it took on a lot of game of the years. And I'm not saying that it wouldn't deserve it, 
I'm not saying it doesn't deserve game of the year, you know, but in that particular year, it was the only option for yeah. game of the year. There wasn't much out there you could argue as being better than Shadow of Mordor. But if it came out this year, it's like number six. Yeah. If you were to do a top ten list, you know, maybe Lord number of the Rings seven. Is one of those strange game, one of those strange franchises that actually puts out really good games. Yeah, there's been a lot of really like the fucking movie games are surprisingly good. You know, three D beat 'em ups mm-hmm. like the hack and slash games. I forget what the one was, but there was one you could play as like uh, you could play as Gandalf and you could play as. Uh, it's probably the Two Towers game, but they also did I like a, a Fellowship of the Ring. There's a Fellowship of the Ring and a, and a Return of the King one, but then they did one between. This one wasn't that great, but it was the one between um, Shadow of Mordor and and the the one previous. And they did have a Lord of the Rings online too. Yeah. So there's a bunch of they've been. They've this one was like midlife of, three, of the three sixty or something like that. Yeah, I remember I had a demo, and then I ended up getting a copy from somebody for a while, and uh, I played through it. and It was like really, really good. Beat 'em up. Yeah, was, I'm really I shocked that they were able time. to get like. I don't remember. I didn't really track the rights down or follow like the, the where the rights went to and everything. But like, you know, EA had the movie license, you know, yeah. and and the other company, um, Sierra, which was then bought by Activision, was it Sierra? Was it NCS? It was one of these other publishers, but they were bought by another big publisher, and they had the book license. Yeah, and so like that's why there was that weird like. 3D platformer Hobbit game that came out. Yeah. Well, when the movies came out, you know, like that, not the Hobbit movies, but the uh, Lord of the Rings movies came yeah. out. There was a Hobbit game for like PS2 and GameCube and shit like that. Yeah. Uh, so they had like the book license. And like with this game, it obviously is using the design and the aesthetic of the movie universe. Yeah. You know, and I can't, I you know, I don't know if it's like a, conscious decision because that's the thing everybody knows visually yeah. when you talk about lord of the rings you're talking about the movie universe you're talking about you know that design philosophy yeah or if it was like the tolkien estate was like this is the aesthetic for lord of the rings yeah. when it's like a visual model because it did a good job of that yeah you know i don't know i think it did a really good job too of putting a lot of love into the enemies especially like the war chiefs and the yeah captains and all. it's really cool when you get beat by a lowly nothing Orc that they for get some like yeah, and, and they get promoted and they get they distinct get features, you know, kind of shit. Yeah. like between them just becoming some low like regular green little orc, and then the next thing you know they fucking flash and they got fucking crazy armor with you know people bones all over, and you're yeah. like yeah okay. There was this one guy. It was like uh, so and so, like the leathersmith or something yeah. weird like that, and he had armor made entirely of human faces. Yeah, that guy. That guy is that fucking guy, creepy. Yeah. So, I mean, I like. I, I just think like. You could release a, a the next Shadow of Mordor could literally just be the same exact game, but like millions more options when it comes to that kind of yeah. stuff, and it would just be even more. It would be even more amazing. Yeah, like when it gets to the point where it's like you will never see the same character twice. Yeah. You know, when it gets to that, like the level of randomness is so high yeah. that you'll never see the same character twice. Like that's what I expect from it. You just give me the exact same game. You don't have to go crazy with the combat or change up the landscape or anything. You know, I would take it out of Mordor. Yeah. Only because Mordor is very bleak and dark and everything. Yeah, that's why I liked it, going to that. shit to the Shire. Yeah. That's why I like going <laughs> to the other half of it though. Because like when you got past the main Mordor instead area. of uh, instead of Uric's, which one thing that's a note that I noticed was that they even they refer accidentally to Uric's as orcs a lot. Yeah, the Urukai and the orcs are different things yeah. in the universe, but they just sort of they blend it out in the yeah. game. Yeah, anyway. I guess Uric is like the orc term for orc, and then like Urukai is well, when they, you they actually the mix an orc that, with goblin. They say at the beginning that uh, some of these aren't orcs, they're Uruks, they're much worse. Yeah. But then they start referring to them as orcs later on. Yeah. Like, oh, well, there are orcs and there are Uruks, but I don't know why the orcs, because like the orcs looked completely different than the Uruks in the movie. I don't know. Like the uh, Uruks were like, I always had the impression that they were uh, orc and goblin hybrids or yeah. something like that or something. Yeah. And the goblins, like, that would be a cool thing. Like, bring in the goblins from the fucking Hobbit movies. You have a design for them, you yeah. know? You have a, a, a philosophy for how they're to be designed. Bring in the dwarves from yeah. the Hobbit movies, that design philosophy. Just go all out with it. Just go full fan fiction with it. The only thing I can yeah. think that's holding them back for that kind of stuff would be the Tolkien estate yeah. and not wanting something that doesn't reflect their property. But again, like I said, we're talking about a game that turns you into the fucking best guy in the entire land. <laughs> 
you know, and that doesn't properly reflect the Tolkien yeah. I message or whatever ideology. I'd really like to see that kind of concept done with a wizarding type, kind of like Gandalf. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily Gandalf himself, but, you know, a type like Gandalf. Yeah. Because uh, that game that I was talking about, the, the Two Towers one. Yeah. Uh, the Gandalf combat was really, really good, and it wasn't overpowered. You know, it wasn't like you have to use magic in particular ways. It doesn't take time. It flew. It flowed really well yeah. into each other, and it was re- made a lot of sense. But it didn't like. I feel like they could do a lot with a magic system <laughs> um, outside of simple spell casting yeah, stuff. It didn't like, go out of character for Gandalf yeah. either. I, and that could be something for a different kind of universe or a different style of game. But like, I've always had this really interesting idea, and I think it would make a good like sort of roguelike basis or something like that would be like you ever played that game alchemy uh no i have not it's sort of like this i've played a lot on phones there's like a billion and a half versions of it out there but the entire idea of the game there's like the big one's doodle god it's like the big one that everybody knows about yeah uh the entire point of it is you take elements and you add them together to create new elements out of those ones so like you know you start off with the basic four elements you know yeah. fire earth wind and you add, you know, fire to water, and you get steam. Yeah. Or you add fire to water, and you get vodka sometimes, <laughs> you know, depending on who makes the game. And, you know, you can add, like, air to fire, and then you get, you know, hot air or something like that. Or you get, <laughs> you know, air to water, and you get rain, or you get a cloud or something like that. And it just gives you all kinds of stuff. So, like, that, but for a magic system. Yeah. Like, imagine, like taking the sort of Vancean spell component system of a D and D type game where it's like, Hey, you actually, you know, if you want to create the sphere of lightning, you got to rub a glass wand <laughs> with some <laughs> By steel. The way, when he said that, he did a very, very <laughs> obvious jerking it off. Motion. Yeah. Like, well, that's what it is. You got to jerk <laughs> out the thing and make the lightning come it's out. Like that's and pestle. Jesus. <laughs> that's literally what it is in D and D. Like they don't, you don't, I don't really go into it whenever I DM or anything, but if I was going to go like really, be a hardcore motherfucker, I would say, no, like yeah. you've got to go to the store and buy the iron filings yeah. before you or can the, create this. To do press the, digitation, you have to have a piece of yarn. like Yeah, exactly. Like shit like that. And that's, we, play, you, we play D&D house rules. Yeah, because <laughs> the magic system for wizards is so mean. It really is. Like that's the only reason why. It's because like it revolves a lot of out of game preparation, like a lot, or a lot yeah. of just preparation in general that would become distracting or difficult to maintain yeah, there's already enough micromanagement exactly and for wizards it's even worse because you got like the entire point is you <coughs> have to first you have to get the spell book yeah so then you have to come up with an in-story reason as to why you have a spell book then to learn the spells you have to then find an in-story reason as to why you know these spells yeah. and then on top of that you have to have the components and know the vocal and semantic components for the spells <laughs> To then be able to, and then have the material components to then be able to cast all of them. But it's like, that's just how wizards work in that world. If you want an easier system, you become a sorcerer. Yeah. Because then you just innately know how to cast these (laughs) things. With a wizard, it's about learning and knowledge and all that stuff. That's why wizards in original, like, first edition and second edition of D&D were not humans. Unless you, like, did some really evil shit, like, went full lich. Like, unless you went, like, full lich, you were not going to be a human and be a wizard because... You did not live long enough to even learn basic cantrips. You know, like you're talking like you need like decades of knowledge to be able to memorize and recite pages of spell vocal component to be able to recite them from memory and use them up. It's like the Vancean system is what it's called because it came from this author named like I think it's a George Vance or something like that. And the entire system was based on this fantasy post-apocalyptic sci-fi fantasy world where it's like the wizards were just people that were able to memorize this magical language and they could memorize it and they could only really say it once yeah. or a few times before it just left their brain completely and they had to start relearning the entire thing yeah. again. And so like that's the basis of the wizard system. I would not go that far. Yeah. <laughs> but but you know, if I was going to make a game with that kind of system cuz I think it would be really interesting if you were in like a cavernous system sort of like a 2D top-down thing. And, like, the environment was vaguely destructible, and you had to get through this sort of dungeon crawl, 
but then you're collecting things along the way from the environment that you can then combine together to create more powerful spells as the game went on by finding higher level components or whatever. Yeah. I think if something like that would be interesting. That flowed really well into the, our last topic, by the way. I know, Tabletop right? gaming. Exactly, yeah. And I was going to talk about um, tabletop gaming because I was get, I'm was i getting back in on D&D kick a little bit. and uh, I've been wanting to do a new campaign. Yeah. I, I really want to finish the campaign that I started, the really fucked up, not even D&D <laughs> at all thing. Yeah, you gotta go. You for that one, you just need to find a different system. Because I was thinking about that earlier when I was when I was going back to playing. Because I was like, you know, just thinking about trying to remember everything we did in the last yeah. game. Because what I wanted well, the first do, part was very like generic, like um, what what was it, Leviathan? I had you guys fight. Yeah, and then ended up sending you back in time and you, or forward or forward in time, forward in time or to another dimension, to another or dimension where you ended up in World War Two and fought Hitler and had to learn German. Yeah, and then like. At the end of that. Like, that is a perfect setup for, like, a one-shot kind of thing, and it has to be, like, pre-generated characters by you, the DM, yeah. with the knowledge that this is the game we're playing and don't try to fucking get off my rails or anything, yeah. you know? Like, this is the game we're playing. You know, don't be a jerk, basically. You know, like, there's a, there's a limit to the world as it were you know i can only yeah. have so much scope of this game this is the game we're playing and it's only going to last one session so don't get too crazy yeah you know about what all the crap you want to do this is what we're playing yeah like, that's the kind of way you do it and I, there's a lot of systems out there that i think would be more applicable for that would be more of like a universal system yeah uh that can cover those massive time skips between technological advancement and everything like that because yeah. like if you're talking about a fantasy world people that then go into the vague future alternate you know thing and then fight Hitler well now you gotta come up with stats for guns and tanks yeah. and body armors and all that stuff that was like one that. thing I, I thought was pretty brilliant in my own campaign just to toot my own horn was uh, when uh, Alan tried to pick up the gun and use it Yeah, and uh, I made him do an intelligence check <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what would happen. You're just sitting yeah. there like, uh, I just, just, uh, unless you were very observant and watched somebody else use yeah. it, but then like, I'm glad did you, I reload I'm glad it? I didn't roll a one though, because there's only one way that he would shoot himself fail. in his foot or shoot himself <laughs> in the hand or do something else. Like it would just be like, you know, just full on <laughs> bad business. Yeah. Like, and, and, and like, there's an interesting game there. I just think it just doesn't work in a D and D type setting. I think yeah. because, you know, but that's the, that's really the mindset of the players, especially though, like not me because I have a little bit more of a wider worldview when it comes to tabletop role playing games. Yeah. But the average layperson, their experience for tabletop role playing games is at most D and D. Yeah, they're not going to be able to even talk to you on any level about anything, even D and D. Yeah, <laughs> but especially not something like a Savage Worlds or a GURPS or you yeah. know a World of Darkness or something like that. What was the game that we played with the clones? Uh, I cannot remember. That was oh, a good the game. Oh, <laughs> Paranoia. Paranoia. Paranoia that was is, a great campaign. It's really, I really interesting. It. Like I think I think the concept is interesting. Again, a lot of these games come with built-in settings. Like Paranoia as a game doesn't work if you take Paranoia out of Paranoia. Yeah. Like if you don't set it within an underground post-apocalyptic society where everybody just gets cloned over and over again and there's friend computer who's helping you along <laughs> the way but he's like a maniacal vaguely how like you know ma vicious machinations kind of thing like that's the that's the environment that, that game's set in and that's the only way that game works yeah you know but that's why there are systems out there like savage worlds i ordered the savage world uh deluxe explorers edition book for because it's only like 10 bucks like that if you just really expensive <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you say deluxe explorers edition it's like no it's like 10 bucks like yeah, a little paper bag that, that would be a 200 fucking book. 60 bucks yeah. for just the core <laughs> rule books like if you want to buy all three you're going to be spending over 180 dollars um but the um the 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 core book for it, and savage worlds is a universal role playing system yeah it is a rules system you come up with the setting, you come up with what you want to do, and you apply the rules of Savage Worlds to what you want to do. I have another system like that, another book at home called Tri TriStat DX. Yeah. And TriStat DX actually covers a very wide berth of what it what it allows you to do within it. You know? Yeah, we've talked about that before. Yeah, it um it it can you can be as lowly as a fucking field mouse <laughs> or as powerful as a celestial god. And the way they track the that as the dark side of the moon. Exactly. <laughs> um, and you start off as, you know, a, you know, a D four being the lowest. Yeah. 
and a D20 being the highest. Of course. <laughs> and that's why it's called DX, because like where you fall within this power spectrum mm. determines which die is going to be your main rolling die for the game. Because your target numbers, which you're trying to roll under, are going to be much higher yeah. when you go up to a higher level. You know, so like if you're trying to roll under a 15, you're not going to be rolling with a D20. Yeah. You're going to have a much higher chance of hitting that with a 20, you know. So you might yeah. be rolling with, you know, a D12 or something like that. Yeah. So that's that's because, you know, there are actual additional <laughs> bonuses and negatives, rather. Yeah. It's a weird system because you have to take your brain out of D&D, which is used to you add this to this and you get this, yeah. and then you're trying to get over the target number yeah, over the you DC. Yeah, beat armor class. You yeah, you're trying to always beat the numbers, and yeah. Tristad's all about rolling under. You want to get below that number because yeah. if you don't... It's like golf. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's just one of those weird like choices that the designers make to differentiate themselves from the pack, I guess, and it's less about an actual mechanical reason for it other than... Well, these it's numbers go down. Yeah. You know? It's like golf. Yeah. Same reason. <laughs> exactly. Um, I did. I was looking into D and D Fifth Edition because it came out fairly recently, oh, about a did. year old. Yeah. Shit, I don't even know. Um, is it at least better than? 4E? It's way better than four. Yes. Like from 4E, what I from what I've seen, what I've heard about. Life. Well, I've, well, five seems like they they simplified three point five, uh, which is great because there was there's, sim- there's a difference between simplifying and streamlining. They streamlined it. Okay. Um. Because 3.5 was like a rules lawyer's fucking game. Yeah. If you really were interested in all the fucking crunch and learning every single fucking detail, more power to you. Yeah. The only problem I've always had with 3.5 is, at what point are we not playing D and D? If I am not play, if I am not actually following these overly complicated, overly minute rules to the T are we even playing this game anymore are right. we just playing some vague facsimile of it that we created in our heads that's kind of what we really were doing exactly and that's when what you do magic system. right because you want to fucking house rule this shit just to get it out of the way because it's overly right. complicated or it messes with your story or your verisimilitude of your world yeah. like I don't have any place for advancing a magic system in whatever setting I'm coming from it right. so then you have the implied setting of the D&D universe but I don't want to play in that setting. Yeah. I don't give a shit. I give two shits less about Forgotten Realms or fucking Greyhawk or any of that shit. I want to play in the world that I create from the ground up, and I want to build that world so that, and everybody else gets to build a piece of that world, and they get to all kind of have a knowledge of it without having to read tomes of fucking yeah. fantasy And that's what text. D&D really is about, is creating your own world and characters. Exactly, and, and that's what I think it's about. That's what I feel like it's about, and I feel like the... Rules of 3.5 got in the way of that sometimes. Yeah. But again, it's like, what point are you not playing D&D anymore? Yeah. Um, so, the the five, the five fourth edition, the problem with fourth edition was the combat was overly complicated. Yeah. Um, not that it was a bad complicated, like, not because the rules were so crazy, but they did so much to overpower the player characters. Yeah. So then they had to do a lot to overpower the monsters. Because they gave the player characters these daily use power cards, even for fighters and stuff. They were treated like yeah. special abilities, like they were spells or something, instead of like abilities. Abilities, you know, instead of something you could do constantly. You know, it's something that you don't have to do a roll for anymore. It's just a one time use. I yeah, can do it. Exactly. And that's, um, and, and, and they. I mean, it was an interesting concept, but they were trying to attract a certain crowd from it. And they really super simplified the rules for four when it came to a lot of that stuff mm-hmm. because they wanted to attract a particular crowd. And they were trying to attract the World of Warcraft video games crowd you know, right. by giving them the essentially paper tabletop versions of hotkeys yeah. <laughs> for, a, you know, for a World of Warcraft. Uh, for fifth edition, they gave people something a little bit extra. They basically expanded upon the 3.5 systems. But they simplified all the math, yeah, by making it something more interesting. I think more more mechanical, more gamey that can actually like influence the game. They use this something that's called advantage and disadvantage. Yeah. You're teaching me right now because I yeah. heard shit about five. Five is again, like I said, on a very basic level, it's very three point five. Yeah, but I mean, that's good. Yeah, the big change comes in the well. The feats are really different, but I won't get into that. Yeah. But the big change comes in advantage and disadvantage. 
Um, because you know in 3.5 you have spells and buffs and things like that that affect you by giving you plus two or plus five to this, this, or that. Yeah. Well, for 5 5th edition, they instead say, well, no, it gives you advantage. You know, and so instead of saying it's a plus five, you say, well, it's an advantage. So what does advantage mean? It means when you have advantage, no matter what gave it to you, you know, be it a special attack or, you know, some other character's buff spell or a benefit of your race or something like that for some happening in the game. Yeah. You get to roll 2d20 and you pick the highest number. Oh, hey. That's kind of cool, actually. Yeah. It's a bit more gamey. It adds more game to the game. You yeah. know, it adds something a bit more interesting and can have some fun with. Uh, but then there's also the opposite of that, which is disadvantage. When something happens to you and you have disadvantage, you roll 2d20 and you pick the lowest uh. of the number. So that's how they that's how they get you, and it really makes for an interesting thing. You don't have to do all this math. You don't have to fuck around with, you know, fucking scratch sheets of paper and shit like that. Yeah. You get it streamlines the game a bit more. And the other big thing that I like a lot is they simplified saving throws to pretty much having a saving throw for every stat. Yeah. Instead of giving you reflex, fortitude, will, you know, they give you make a strength check. Make a dexterity check. You know, you don't have to go through this list of fucking skills. Yeah. <laughs> you just say, okay, well, do you see it? Well, give me a, you know, you give me a perception check. Yeah. Okay. That's kind of how You we need to pick anyway, this up. Though. Give me a strength check. And that's how we <laughs> play. Now, a lot of that came from fourth edition, <coughs> but they made it, they simplified that even more because the skills, again, super complicated. Yeah. And there's a game out there called Pathfinder that is 3.5. Yeah. Like there's uh there's no denying it. Like, it came from the D twenty open game license uh that Wizards of the Coast created for D and D three point five and they just basically said, Well, it's an open game license, we can do what we want, let's just make three point five but make it better. Yeah. And the best way to bribe is like three point seven five or the real fourth edition. <laughs> like that's basically the the best way to describe it. Um in fifth edition, the real inward fourth edition. Yeah, <laughs> and they're also real doing inward a, hours now, <laughs> right? And they're they're doing a lot of really cool stuff with. Uh, fuck this chair. Uh, they're doing a lot of really cool <laughs> stuff. That chair fucks you. Yeah, uh, a lot of really cool stuff or with. Roll me a uh, de- dexterity check. Or? Yeah, no, right. Um, they give me a lot of like really cool stuff with the internet and how that it, how dungeon masters and players interact with the internet. Um, they have this thing called the Dungeon Masters Guild, which is essentially like a crowdsourced campaign stuff. So it's like, hey, you join the Dungeon Masters Guild, you start writing up adventures and you know creating characters and creating worlds, and you start publishing materials for those things onto this thing, and it's all free for everybody to use. But if we really like it, we'll pay you and license your creation into our system and use it and then release it as an official product on this other site that is related to D&D 5.0. Uh, yeah. And people can download those things so they can pay money for them to get a PDF for it or whatever. And they're really doing a lot of cool shit like that. Like then That's they just really cool. That's a yeah. good idea. And I think that they do they do what people want them to do with that thing, which is really sort of open it up. Cuz that was really the problem with 4th edition. Their way of opening it up was the D and D Essentials line, yeah. And the D and D Essentials line is the most fucking confusing thing in the world. I own all the D and D Essentials products, as someone who owns all of the D and D Essentials, <laughs> and it's my full main introduction to Fourth Edition. I can tell you, it is not user friendly at all. Yeah, even the fucking D and D four E for dummies is not easy. Like I, I tried to to start everything using that, and I started yeah. a campaign with like Jabo at some point. Yeah. And, of course, I was running off the the 3.5 knowledge of, you know, how strong enemies should be and shit. And, like, the first enemies they come to with, like, straight-up rolled characters, like, first boss characters, like, they just wrecked as shit because I didn't realize exactly how OP everything was. Right. So, like, I had to instantly, like, ramp the shit up, you know. And that's where you're into trouble because you're yeah. like, well, how far do up this ramp do I go? And that's why I like playing 3.5. Is because there's so many tools out there. Because it was an open game, um, 
they essentially allowed so many people to create tools and products for this particular rule set. So you can go out there, you can find character builders, you can find NPC, random NPC tables, all kinds of stuff yeah. that are made specifically to be used with D&D 3.5. There's like probably 50 or 60 Android apps. I oh, mean, there's yeah. a ton. Yeah, I got two on my phone right now. They're just for like run for running encounters. The other one's for maintaining campaigns, which I don't use. Yeah, because I, I spell can book and like a like a some kind of counter for my wizard build whenever we were. Yeah, playing. so like that's what's really cool about it. They do a really good job of like keeping that stuff in check. Yeah, and uh, giving the options to the players again instead of giving it to their massive corporation. Power that, to the players. Well, the, I mean, <laughs> Watsy could give two shits less about the D and D franchise. You know, like they they see no future in it. You know, because yeah. like shit, they don't even see a future of magic anymore. You know, like they don't know where their future is, so they're yeah. just kind of like Fucking do they're shit. not putting all their eggs in one basket, which is good. But they're also like being very hands off with five point oh, you know, yeah. like they're they're giving it to the players almost to me like to do with three point five, and say hey this is yours, do with it what you will. We'll sell you these books every once in a while. I'm just wondering when there's gonna be a VR like tabletop game where you're not actually in a VR, but you're world. sitting around a you're table, actually sitting yeah. at a table. No, with tabletop other simulator, man. Yeah, tabletop simulator is that game. Like <laughs> tabletop simulator is like I want to buy that game just to run a D and D campaign with it. Yeah, because like it. This is like everything built in. Yeah, yeah. Like and there's like Steam Workshop support, so like you can fucking straight up get like little tabletop you know like the people go way fucking out there with their fucking yeah. map designs by actually building dungeons on their tables and shit you cool. can do that with the tabletop nice. simulator and so you can go full all out like hey, this is the dungeon you we'll know? have to do that one day and, and there's like, a button to flip it. the table <laughs> <laughs> table flip dot exe <laughs> Uh, all right, we're going on just over an hour now. Yeah, I think that's how to wrap it up. All right, that's going to be it for the Saga Pod tonight, guys. We're releasing this just after we finish, so have fun with that. <laughs> um, one thing I did want to mention is uh, I actually started a Fiverr um, as doing some voice acting shit just to make a couple extra bucks to make this mic pay itself off. <laughs> um, you know, I, I do a bunch of voices and shit like uh, like Butthead and all. Yeah. Should I do my Butthead? If you want. <laughs> I'm just gonna be over here. The wrong. fuck, butthead. Fuck you. Fuck dill hole. <laughs> I can't think of any fucking lines. Any uh, butthead lines? Yeah, like uh, you said, Enith or Anith. I can't even fucking. <laughs> I'm actually a pretty decent uh, voice actor when it comes to that. You know, and I also have an announcer voice. It kind of sounds like shit. I'm hey, kidding. that's not my right. voice. When when I get under pressure to do it live. It's one thing, but when I can sit there and actually think it out and have a script, I'm pretty good. Anyway, that's on Fiverr if you find it. I don't even know if you like have any way of finding me. But, hey, look for a voice actor that does butthead. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there's a bunch more. Uh, also, don't forget to go to Facebook.com slash Sagopod and Sagopod.com and the Sagopod Twitter and Russell, Russell Radio Australia, Frank and Josh Armour's thing. Uh, what Butts else? We got? There's a bunch of more shit. Butts and Seats. Butts out of seats. Uh, butts butts near seats. seats. Uh, it's it's on extended hiatus because of my shitty internet connection. So. All right, yeah. You We're trying to get it all worked out. It. Yeah, that's been kind of one of the things we tossed around. We had another idea that I'm not going to talk about on here because, I don't, you know, it's original content. Do not steal. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> For the wrestling bit? Yeah, yeah. Because, like, I... How's your phone connection? Can you possibly do it? I could if I stood outside on one foot with my hand in the air. I can get LTE, but other than that, like... yeah. And what? not to mention, like, fucking Google Hangouts is really weird about not wanting to, like, if you just call somebody on Google Hangouts, it's fine. <laughs> but if you're trying to call a Hangout on air, it just it just won't connect. Huh. Like, if it's trying to connect, because it's trying to, you know, play it live, you know, it's trying to look yeah. for you. But just do Discord, man. Discord fucking great. Yeah. Even the phone app's great. It does seem a lot better than Skype, that's for it's, sure. I it's definitely, really I mean, I, like, nice. Josh can't find a Skype recorder to save his life and Google Hangouts. So the Google Hangouts really, it's only just there so that we can talk to each other. Yeah. Like, the actual recording process is done on both of our ends, and then we send them, and he re he puts them together. Yeah. And he does a really good job with it because it sounds like f we're in the same room, yeah. But we're talking to each other over a Google Hangouts thing, yeah. Um, I mean, you you could always, if he wants to do a single track, do what I did with this recorder. You know? I mean, yeah, but he he's you know he's got the all that shit figured out. But the problem is just like 
I haven't even really tried it, but I don't trust my internet connection to hold up for a, an extended yeah. converse, hour-long conversation. If you want, when you get home, we can always try Discord, get on there, and hop on and try yeah. to talk. I mean, it's just about like getting it all set up. Not to mention, yeah. like, because I don't think you need that much bandwidth to uh, VoIP. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, it's not really so much about the the bandwidth's fine. It's the uh, it's just the speed is just the worst part about it. Like, cause it'll just drop. Yeah, that's what I meant. The fucking speed. Yeah, right. like the the, ba- the stability like, is what you're what you're getting. At. Yeah, and and because it's it's satellite, you know. Yeah. I can't I can't predict the weather, you know, and like <laughs> even like a strong breeze will throw that thing off sometimes. Yeah. So uh, it's it's but I have another idea, and we've been talking about it for a bit now, and I think it's actually if I, you know, without spoiling too much, I think it's a more marketable idea than uh, a, a yet another wrestling review show. Not another wrestling podcast. Yeah, exactly. That's really the, been the biggest issue with being butts in seats is that it is yet another wrestling review show, and it's not even the only WCW show. When I first came up with the idea, we were the only WCW show. Yeah. But by the time we got, got popular, started going... Yeah. You know, because we'd been talking about the idea for a while, but I finally, the time we sat down, we started recording it, two or three other ones pop up out of nowhere. Of course they do. Yeah, you know, so it's like, well, now we don't have that edge anymore of yeah. being the being the WCW show. Now it's like there's four others, and they're better than us. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I don't think they're funnier than us. I don't think we're funnier, but they're more, more knowledgeable. Well yeah. More Well, not even more well-produced. Like, they're shitty fucking Skype calls and shit like that. Yeah. I think they're more... More knowledgeable of the product. I mean, I well, fucking, you know, I'm you're always, you're always the most critical of your own work. Yeah, because people seem to love us, and we kind of suck. Yeah, <laughs> I don't I don't know what that is. Um, I, don't know. I mean, I'm not even that funny on this show anymore. I know, right? We, we're we're actually serious, but people seem to like it. Or at least some people do. <laughs> Maybe we're appealing to the right crowd. Now. I, I guess. Know. Yeah, when it was By all the about way, being funny. Uh, speaking of people that actually like us, I think. Uh, shout out to Vi, Orange Star, Mr. McPone, and Kex for All, and whoever the hell else, uh, Mighty S. Chan, and Cacklebot <laughs> on uh, on the Jeep Discord. Uh, you guys are always great to hang out with and actually support me. Cause like I like half of them followed on Twitch and uh, um, what the hell you call it, Twitter and all that. Yeah, they're they're, they're real bros. They're they're cool guys. But uh, shout sure. out to you guys if you make it this far. Yeah, <laughs> you probably won't. I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll tell them they have a shout out, then they'll have to listen the whole way right, through. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's in there somewhere. Yeah, it's just backward masks, very low in the mix <laughs> across the entire podcast. What's that weird noise? What the hell is that? Yeah, I'm, I I know one of them is gonna bitch about being left out, and I'm sorry. I was just scrolling through like the most recent messages on there, and I'm like, oh, okay, well these guys, these are the ones I can remember at the moment. I'm just here for the ride. <laughs> what y'all? Have your little close knit community of people. I'll be over here. I wouldn't say close knit, just like the only people in the G Discord. <laughs> <laughs> people that hanging out in this. Oh, also hole. Fagman. I don't know if I called him out. Fagman. Yeah, he, he's the he's the admin. He's very 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 gay, but like not in the gay like cool guy way. He's just fucking really gay. He's just like, really he, gay. He's, he's gay in the four chan way. Okay. Yeah. So it's like, you know. Yeah. He's, he's not going to listen to I don't think he's one of the ones that listens. So uh, we'll all get a good chuckle out of that because he's kind of an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> really, really gay. Yeah. All, all right. right. So, bye, guys. Bye. Catch you later. Bye. Kenobi Ninja Giant. Bandit. Soul of 99. 48 Vitality. 66 Endurance. 12 Movement. 16 Fucking Strength. 10 Dexterity. But don't pound it when you level that up, you fucking faggot. What are you, a casual? Giants, 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 become unstoppable. What made you that bitch? People think, bring favor and attention, stab, health, and endurance. Everything you could ever want. Black flame, black flame. That ain't the plus bitches. Father Mask, the best looking mask in the game. And of course, don't fucking forget, your Chaos Commander and Grass Crash Shield. Well, what is it? Are you cool yet? It's time to fucking hold some rules. Initiate Phase 1. Power up the Breeze Cannon. Fire!